Hello everyone and welcome to my channel this is the 17th part of what if Deku can't stop adopting kids hope you enjoy link to the original story and author in the description. Chapter 86, Why Me? The last location they'd be visiting tonight was the place Yami had been eager to visit. A festival. A pretty sizable one as well. Fill to the brim with games, art, prizes, and most importantly, food. The moment Yami stepped onto the festival ground, and the aromas of all the different dishes, he was gone. Simply put he was on cloud nine and no one could pull him down. And Amai was not far behind, standing beside Yami as the two of them just stood there with their eyes closed, taking in the smells with huge smiles on their faces and tears in their eyes. It's beautiful, Amai whispered blissfully. So beautiful. Yes. Yami agreed. Beautiful. I think you two like food a bit too much. Nina joked patting Yami on the head. Nonsense. Yami and Amai said sharply. Yagi chuckled a bit behind them. I think enjoying food is a wonderful thing. Trust me, as someone who can't quite enjoy that aspect of life to its fullest anymore, I think these two should take every opportunity to enjoy all sorts of cuisine. So don't be afraid to eat up. We won't, Yami said, as he and Amai quickly moved towards the food stalls. Yanda. Leaving this to you. Of course, you are you blutton. Yanda thought to herself as she rolled her eyes. Beep. Beep. Your phone is ringing. Your phone is ringing. Suddenly Yagi's phone started ringing. He took it out and his eyes widened when he looked at who was calling. Kathleen Bait. Go on without me for a while kid. I need to take this. Yagi told them as he walked away. All right you, you too. Looks like it's just the three of us. Nina said to Yanda and Kyoku. So kids, where do you want to want to go first? I want to play a game first. Yanda said before she grabbed Kyoku by the hand. Follow me, sister. XXXXXXXX. The first game they decided to play was goldfish scooping. And Kyoku looked like she was about to cry. No matter how hard she tried, the paper bowl would keep breaking each time she tried to scoop a fish. Oh come on! Kyoku shouted in frustration as the bowl broke again. Ha! Your scoops are far too aggressive young one. The bowl is fragile, but your movements are too strong. Patience is needed to win this game. The old man who was running the game told her with a kind smile. And Kyoku responded in kind, with a heavy glare. Man, she is a very sore loser. Yanda thought, holding up her own bag full of goldfish as she heard the onslaught of swears Kyoku was slinging at the man in her head. Seeing that Kyoku was not having a good time, to say the least, Mina decided to step in. All right, let's go somewhere else. Thanks, sir. Mina told the old man as she lead the two girls away. Kyoku pouted as Mina led her away, not at all pleased and her mood only worsened when something caught her eye. It was a small family. A father and a mother, with their daughter in between them. She was holding both her parents' hands and had a huge grin on her face, her parents looked just as happy, with soft smiles as they looked down at their daughter. It was a wholesome sight that sent Kyoku into a rage. Lucky. 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 You don't even know how good you have it. Honestly, Yanda didn't even need to hear Kyoko's thoughts to understand that she was really, really upset. Her face held an expression of pure fury, and she looked even closer to crying than before. For a second, Yanda thought she was actually was going to cry. But then, she suddenly started to calm down, or rather she started trying to calm down, taking a deep breath and trying to calm herself. Why does it hurt so much? I have a family now. I love them so much. But why does it still hurt? Daddy loves us all so much. And I love him. So why does it still hurt? Kyoku was still trying to calm herself down, to little avail. She was trying to hold back tears and sniffling. It was upsetting to look at. And of course, Mina took note of it almost immediately, her eyes widened when she noticed the state of the small girl. 
She quickly kneeled down in front of Kyoku. Hey, Kyoku, what's wrong? Nothing. Kyoko sniffled, looking away from her as some tears finally started welling up in the corners of her eyes. I'm fine. You don't look okay, Mina said, pointing out the obvious but in an obviously concerned way. Hey it's okay, we can go home early if that's what you want. I said I'm fine. Kyoko shouted, attracting some attention from the people around them. Come on girl, we both know that's not true, Mina said in a somewhat comedic tone, smiling at her, hoping to lift the mood but once again, to no avail. And that's okay. No, it's not. Kyoko cried, tears actually spilling out of her eyes now. It's not okay. These feelings should go away. Um, I don't know what feelings you're talking about honey, but if you want to talk about it dash, Mina once again tried to reach out to her, but was once again turned away. Go away. I want my daddy. Kyoko shouted, turning away from Mina. I want my daddy. Meanwhile, Yanda couldn't actually hear any of this of course. All she could hear was daddy can fix this. Daddy, please come make this better and things like that. Kyoku just calmed down. Yanda tried to tell her. Let's just go home and daddy will. No. Kyoko shouted, forgetting that Yanda couldn't hear her, but she could read her expression well enough to get what she was saying. Get out of my head. Go away. Kyoku then turned and started running away. Oh crap. Kyoku wait. Mina started running after her, quickly turning her head to Yanda. Yanda please go find Mr. Yagi and tell him what's happening. Okay. Yanda told her, before quickly running back towards the entrance. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
I know people can be nice. I know people do nice things. I know parents besides daddy can love their children. So why didn't they love me? After letting that all out, Kyoko started breathing heavily, trying to regain all the air she just let out, her face now red and sweaty, and tears were still pouring down her cheeks. There was a period of silence as Kyoko took a second to calm down and regain her breath, and Mina didn't know what to say, or if she should say anything at all quite yet. If people can be so nice, then why did I have to go through all that? Kyoko asked, her voice now low and broken, sounding more like a sob than anything. Why did my parents make me go hungry when other parents don't? Why did my parents never hug me? Or smile at me? Or 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 love me at all? All? Mina could feel her heartbreak with each word coming out of the girl's mouth. She'd known this girl had been damaged by her previous parents, but now she finally got to see exactly how damaged she really was. But but I should be fine now. Kyoku sobbed. I have a daddy that loves me a whole lot. And I have sisters and brothers and they love me too. A and I play with them and I have fun. I'm happy. But when I see, when I see people being all happy and families being happy and loving each other I feel, I feel like how I used to. I feel angry and and sad and and jealous. But why do I feel jealous? I have what they have now. What do I still feel like that? Why do I still want people to be bad, so I don't feel like that? I know it's not good. I, I should stop feeling like that. Like Ari and Kay. They're not like this. They don't get angry and sad, and jealous. They don't hate people. S so why am I like this? Kyoko looked up at Nina, with red puffy tear-filled eyes, and asked. I, is there something wrong with me? Is that why mommy and daddy didn't love me? And that's when Mina's heart shattered into a million pieces. Her body moved before she could think, and she immediately brought the girl into a hug. Pressing her against her chest, and rubbing circles into her back. No. Her voice was firm. Strong. Stronger than she felt. Because honestly, Mina wanted to cry. She wanted to cry at the sight of the broken girl in front of her. That her monstrous parents had hurt her this bad and left wounds this deep. And on the inside, her heart sobbed. But on the outside, she remained unshaken, because she had to be. What this girl needed was a rock. Something stable to latch onto for the moment. And since her father wasn't here, she would have to do. And so she summoned strength, she didn't know she had. I'm sorry Kyoku. I'm so sorry you had to go through all that. But I need you to know, what happened with your old parents, was not your fault. Mina told her. Sometimes, sometimes bad things just happen. And it's not about what you did. You were just born into a bad family. Why? Kyoku asked, sobbing into Mina's shirt, her tiny hands clutching it with all her might. Why me? Mina took a deep breath. There was really only one answer she could give. The truth. And it was gonna be really, really hard to say. I'm sorry Kyoko, there isn't a reason. It's just, bad luck. That didn't make Kyoko feel any better, if anything it made her feel worse. All that pain she went through, all the pain she was still going through. Over bad luck. She knew that was the case already. But that's why she wanted to believe that people were naturally just bad. Because then it wouldn't be that she had bad luck. That she was unlucky and suffered for it. But she knew that it was just a lie she told herself. And in the end, hearing Mina say it, she couldn't hide behind that lie anymore. She didn't want to hide behind that lie. She had to let it go, and that hurt. It hurt so, so much. And so Kyoku did what most children do when they're hurt. She cried. And cried. And cried. Mina just waited patiently, letting the little girl sob into her shirt for who knows how long. It felt like hours passed until suddenly they heard a familiar voice. There. It was Yami. He'd probably used his quirk to see the geyser of negative emotions coming off Kyoku. 
Mina heard the sound of footsteps rapidly approaching them until she saw Izuku running towards them. Kiyoku! Izuku shouted. He looked tired, out of breath. But most of all he looked worried out of his mind. Hearing his voice, Kiyoku perked up. Daddy? Kiyoku! Izuku shouted her name again as he got closer and closer to the two of them. Daddy! Kiyoku quickly moved to get out of Mina's embrace and Mina opened her arms to let her escape, knowing that now was the time for her to let go. Kiyoku ran towards Izuku, who was already running towards her. Izuku swept her into a hug, picking her up and holding her in his arms, and she wrapped her arms and legs around him, holding onto him like her life depended on it. Oh, Kiyoku. I'm so glad you're okay. Daddy, I want to go home. Kiyoku told Izuku in a still very broken sounding voice. That's okay sweetie, we're going home right now, Izuku told her. It's okay. We're going home. Meanwhile, behind him, Yagi, Amai, Yami, and Yanda all arrived, with Yagi, in particular, struggling for breath. Finally, we made it. The secret pro hero said as he tried to catch his breath. What's happening? Why is Kyoku crying? Amai asked looking quite upset. Here she was enjoying the food when suddenly something like this happens. Well, it looks like our dear sister had a bit of a breakdown. Yanda explained, her expression being a mix of concerned and annoyed. Hmm. Yami's expression was as usual hard to read. But he definitely looked upset. Mina then walked over to them and fell on her butt, looking more exhausted. Oh my god, I'm so tired. Young Ashido, can you tell me what happened exactly? Yagi asked. It's a long story, Mina responded. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X. The trip back to the Midoriya household was quiet. No one really knew what to say, or if anything they said would be appropriate, so they just kept their mouths shut, the only sounds being that of the car, the city around them, and Kiyoka's sniffles. By the time they got back, it was already nighttime, and given how physically and emotionally exhausted Kiyoka was, it was decided that Izuku would put her to bed. However, given that Kyoku didn't want to leave his side, Izuku decided that she would sleep with him tonight. Kyoku snuggled up to Izuku's side as she laid in his bed, cozied up, up under the covers. Izuku pet her head, trying to soothe her so she could go to sleep. It's okay Kyoku, just go to sleep. I'll be right here with you. I promise. Daddy. You love me, right? Kiyoku asked a hint of desperation in her tone. I love you, and I love all your siblings, more than life itself, Izuku told her, his voice firm and absolute. Never doubt that Kiyoku. I will always love you. I love you too daddy. Kiyoku sniffled, somehow hugging him even tighter. Daddy, why am I so weak? Kiyoku you're not weak, Izuku told her. Why would you think that? Because I'm still letting the past hurt me. Kiyoku explained. Eri and Kay had it much worse than I did. And they're over it. They don't have problems going outside and being around people. Oh, Kiyoku. Izuku sighed. It's not that you're weak, Eri and Kay are, they have a degree of mental strength that most people just don't have. I'm willing to say that 99% of people just don't have the strength of mind to endure everything they have and keep going like that. It's kind of absurd. Although I do think you helped Eri a lot by erasing some of those memories. Still, though, it's not fair to compare yourself to them. That'd be like me comparing my strength of all mites. You're not weak, you're just normal. And that's okay. It's okay to not be able to let things go right away it's okay to be upset that bad things happen to you. It's okay to be hurt. And I'm sorry if I haven't exactly been leading by example. And I haven't provided you all the help you needed. And I'm so so sorry that you had to suffer because of it. It's not your fault daddy you've been busy. Kiyoku tried to defend him. No Kiyoku. My job, first and foremost, is to make sure you're okay, okay. I should have gotten you all therapist. 
Izuku told her, shaking his head. It's my responsibility as a parent to make sure you don't have to suffer like this. And I promise you. You will get help. You're going grow, and I will help you make sure your past doesn't hurt you anymore. Kyoku almost started crying again. The sheer love and affection in his words, all directed at her. His determination to care for her, to love her. It helped her remember that in this moment, she is loved. I love you, daddy. Kyoko said, her heart full and feeling like it was going to burst. Thank you for loving me. Izuku smiled. No need to thank me. You made that easy. That actually did make Kyoku cry. She softly sobbed tears of joy as she snuggled against Izuku's arm. The exhaustion finally overtook her, and she almost instantly fell asleep, tears still streaming from her eyes. Once Izuku was sure she was asleep, he turned his attention to the door. You guys can come in now. After a moment, the door opened and Mina, Yagi, Yanda, and Yami came in. Now, tell me everything that happened, Izuku told them before he turned to Yami and Yanda. And you too. I thought you two might be up to something earlier, and I just let it go because I assumed it would be harmless, but now I'm telling you, what were you two doing? XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Izuku's eyes widened. Really? Yeah, I mean. Mina sighed, her happy-go-lucky expression melting into one that was more upset and frustrated. It's not fair. It's really not fair that these kids had to go through all that. I always respected what you were doing here, helping kids that need help, it's a pretty great thing to do. And I really respect how much effort you put into it but, I don't think I understood just, how important your job was, or how much these kids needed help. The stuff with Kiba was a bit of an eye-opener, and after that interview and the stuff you said about Aries past, ugh, but this was, I've never seen a kid so, broken. I never want to see a kid so broken. It broke my heart to see her that way. But, I'm glad I was there for her. Because I hate thinking about what would have happened if she was alone. Izuku nodded. Kyoko was very, very affection starved. So having someone who cared about her nearby when she was feeling like how she did, was very important, it's why he sent someone like Mina in the first place. These kids deserve to be happy, and loved, and get lots of hugs. Mina said, sounding very determined. And since you can only give so many hugs at once, I want to be there to give them even more hugs. I see. Izuku turned his head up towards her and gave her a relieved smile. Thank you. For caring so much about them. We can talk about the terms of your employment later, but you definitely have the job if you want it. All right. Thanks, sir. I promise I won't let you down. Mina swore, giving him a salute. After today, I have every bit of confidence you won't, Izuku said. Now please leave me and Mr. Yagi alone for a while. We really need to talk. Got it, sir, see you in the morning. Mina said, before exiting the room, finally leaving Izuku and All Might alone. Now All Might, you mentioned something about someone wanting to contact me, asking about a job. Izuku inquired. Right, have you ever heard of Chol Bait? All Might asked him. I don't think so but, that last name does sound familiar, Izuku said, trying to recall where he knew that name from. Well, you're probably more familiar with her older sister. Kathleen Bait. All Might explained. Or as she's more well known as, Star and Stripe. Chapter 87, Reach for the Stars. It's been an strange week for Eri. First was the interview that revealed her backstory to the world. Now, Izuku had already told her that people would treat her differently after he told them this. Not badly, if anything they'd likely be nicer to her. She didn't fully understand what that meant, and thus didn't know what to expect, but she was hopeful. Although she didn't really know what to think about results. Class 1A universally started looking at her with pity, even the more stoic members like Todoroki and Shinso. And they all started treating her like she was made of glass. Giving her a bit more attention and speaking more kindly to her. And Toru just straight broke down sobbing while hugging her, repeating I'm sorry over and over again. Her family also all seemed to change the way they looked at her. Some not so much. K just gave her a pat on the back and said everything was going to be alright, and nothing else. Fu did something similar, patting her on the head and praising her mental fortitude. And Netsa burst into her room and said she was awesome for not letting all that keep her down. Some st started acting a bit more like 1A. Nara and Shiroko kept giving her those pitying looks, and the latter even gave her a nice dress with a note saying that it was a gift for surviving. Mu even showed his face to her for the first time, asking her if it was true, before giving her a very, very brief hug, and then disappearing. Then there were Fuku, who tried to invite her to a tea party with some sweets she made herself, but in the end, Fuku just burst into tears and kept apologizing for thinking that she and Eri went through the same thing when Eri's experience was clearly worse. And Eri ended up having to comfort her. The same thing happened with Kai, who was just overwhelmed with grief for what happened to his big sister, getting his massive tears everywhere. It was a messy situation. Even more messy was Kiba's response to the situation. Kiba was just absolutely enraged when she heard about what happened to her. And she did what she normally did when she got angry. Brutalize Fu. In this case, she decided to stream herself, destroying Fu in horrible and creative ways, for almost an hour. 
threatening to do the same thing to anyone who tried harm even a hair on Aerie's head. She then afterward, proudly showed Aerie the comments on that video, and Aerie honestly wasn't sure what to think. On the one hand, seeing tens of thousands of people all willing to defend her and wishing her well, was very heartwarming. But on the other hand, seeing tens of thousands of people angrily threatening to commit violent murder against anyone who even looked at her funny, made her a bit uneasy. Ari disliked overhaul as much as anyone, while not as much as these people apparently, especially after realizing how unnecessary and spiteful his method of taking blood was. But she didn't like the idea of him getting horribly murdered by enough people. And lastly, Ari was pretty sure Ken was avoiding her. She didn't know why exactly, but whenever she entered a room Ken was in, Ken left, so that was the only conclusion she could come to. Overall, overall, she didn't really know how to feel about all this. It was nice to see how much everyone cared for her, but it was all a bit, much. She didn't have much time to think about it though, because then the house got attacked. Well not really. As it turns out the cat lady that was attacking them and destroying all the grim was just here to ask for a job. But Ari didn't know this at the time, and it terrified her. Being stuck in the practice room with all of her siblings most of whom were also nervous and afraid while Izuku was out there seemingly in potential danger, was one of the worst experiences of her life since she'd come into Izuku's care. And so when Izuku did in fact, end up hiring her, Eri was a bit conflicted at first, but quickly came out feeling positive about the whole thing. Sure she had scared them and given her an unpleasant experience, but she hadn't meant to. And in the end, the only people that got hurt were the Catwoman herself, and a lot of Grimm, but they weren't really living beings anyway. Eri decided instead of focusing on that, she would focus on the fact that they now had a very strong cat lady protecting them. So that was neat. Even neater was that the shock of the incident took attention away from Ari. People still viewed Ari differently now, and would likely continue to view her differently, but the house was no longer focused on pitying Ari anymore. Although Ken was still avoiding her, much to her chagrin. But she didn't have much time to deal with that before Kyoku apparently had a breakdown. So now she was going to deal with that. Because Eri was a good sister. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
wondering when it was going to stop. Eventually, eventually, Kyoka figured out that she'd been hugging her for too long, and did finally let go. I love you, sis. Kyoka told her, hoping desperately to hear it back. I, I love you too. Eri was a bit taken off guard by how affectionate she was being, but quickly deduced it was likely because of yesterday's events. Are you okay? I don't know. Kyoku frowned. Want to talk about it? Yami asked. Normally Kyoku didn't really like talking about her deeply personal feelings, but maybe that was part of her problem. Okay. Kyoku sighed as she got ready to explain. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
so you must be a Suku Midoiriya. Star said, taking a good look at him, through the camera. You really are just a 15-year-old boy. Cassie. Chol scolded her sister. He's not just a 15-year-old boy. He's a 15-year-old boy who is the head of a foundation that helps children in need. A foundation we are currently asking for help. Show a little respect. Right. Right. Sorry. Ha ha. Star laughed. My apologies Midoriya. I'm not the most formal person in the world so forgive me if I seem a bit rude. Just know that I mean no disrespect. I greatly admire your work and the effort you put into helping those children. I it's no issue. Izuku stuttered. Trying not to get riled up at being complimented by America's number one hero. I'm not someone who cares about things like that. Then we should get along swimmingly. Star bellowed. Now, on to the reason, we're here. How much did All Might tell you exactly? He told me that Star and Stripe asking my assistance, involving her sister potentially working here, Izuku said. He said I should get more details from the two of you, and gave me the information needed to set up this call. I see. That's probably for the best. Chol said. This way we won't have, have any misconceptions to deal with. Right. Now, as you can tell, I am rather confused about why you would want to stop working as head of STARS agency, to go to Japan, and work for me specifically. Izuku told them. Of course. Anyone would be confused after hearing that, but I promise you it will all make sense when I explain the situation. Chol assured him. Her voice was very professional, unlike her sister's, in fact, she just to be the opposite of Star in many regards. All right, please do, Izuku told them. Chol took a deep breath, getting all the facts straight in her head, before laying them out for Izuku. So this all started a few months ago. When he finally discovered my daughter, Alice's quirk. Destiny dictation. Izuku wanted to shake the hand of whoever named that quirk. It was a powerful name, for what Izuku could only assume was a powerful quirk. It's a rather complicated quirk, which is why it took us so long to figure out it existed and how it works, but I will try to explain it in the most comprehensive way possible, Chol said. The easiest way to explain would be to give an example. Let's say Alice writes down that at 2 o'clock, you will brush your teeth. Then, at 2 o'clock, you will be very strongly compelled, not quite forced, but very nearly so, to brush your teeth. It doesn't matter if you already did so unless you have a st strong desire not to do so, you will brush your teeth at exactly 2 o'clock. So, it's a quirk that allows her to force others to do things that she's written that they'll do, Izuku said, trying to wrap his head around it. So she really is a sense, dictating destiny. That's, a very powerful quirk. Yes, but there are limitations, Chol told him. Firstly, she has to put in a time. Secondly, she can only influence a person's actions for about an hour a day. Essentially speaking, once she puts in a time, every event she writes has to take place within the hour after time she set, otherwise, it won't have any effect. Unless of course, she does something within that hour that will affect you after the hour is up. Let's say that you start cooking something, but it takes over an hour. She can't make you keep cooking it after the hour is up, but you're likely going to continue doing that anyway. Third, she has to know the full name of the person she's trying to influence, and the person she's trying to influence has to accept that that is their name. Let's say someone's legal name is Barbara, but the person doesn't identify themselves by that name and goes by Sarah. If Alice writes down Baraba, it won't have any effect. Fourth, as I said, her quirk strongly influences people to do what she's written. But it can't necessarily force them. It's not quite mind control. She can't force you to do anything you're too strongly against. For most people, she can't force them to take their own lives or set themselves on fire. The person will still feel influenced to do that, but they likely will just shake it off. Also if you know you're being influenced by Alice's quirk, you can very easily refute it. Fifth is that she can't force you to do anything physically impossible, impossible, although she can make you try. And sixth is contradiction. 
Essentially, if what happens strays away from what she's written, her quirk is nullified. Let's say that she wrote that someone will go into a store, buy bread, leave and then go buy shoes. If the store that person goes into has no bread, then they won't be able to do what Alice wrote, and the rest of what she wrote will be nullified. Meaning they won't have to go and buy shoes. I see. Izuku took that all in, formulating theories and questions in his mind. How specific or vague can these scenarios be? As much as she wants. Although the vaguer she is, the harder it is for her to know exactly what's going to happen. And the more specific she is, the more easily an outside influence can interfere and nullify her quirk's effect. Chol explained. It was a quirk that had a lot of limitations. Strict ones too. Ones that could make the quirk useless if it were used improperly, or if she just got unlucky. But those limitations were almost nothing compared to the possibilities. She could make depressed people end their lives. She could make villains rob a specific bank and allow the heroes to know exactly where they were going to be and when. She could make someone humiliate themselves or ruin their whole lives. If she was dedicated enough she could influence a person's thoughts daily and condition them to the point where either it was easier to control them or to the point where she didn't need to use her quirk at all. And all of this without any risk to herself. Heck, it's more than likely the victims wouldn't even know Alice was ever involved. Of course, the most impressive things Alice could do with her quirk would require resources. Namely information about people's names and possible factors that could nullify her quirk. And if she had those she could subtly change the world on an unimaginable scale. As you can see, my daughter has a powerful quirk to say the least. Chol sighed. She'd definitely be considered. What were they called again? OPCs? Yes. OPCs, my apologies we don't have a system for overly powerful children in America, so I'm unfamiliar with the terms. Although we likely should have something in place like what you have with your foundation. I'm working on it. Star said. Ever since I heard about your foundation I've been pushing to get something similar over here in the States. It's been a bit difficult, but I think I'm making progress. Right. But back to the topic at hand. As you probably know by now. When there are powerful quirks. There are people who want to use them. People may not have the best intentions, but they do have lots of influence. Chol explained, her face and tone dead serious, but Izuku could see a hint of nervousness. As you know, Star's agency works closely with the American government, and as head secretary, that means I also work closely with the American government. And ever since Alice got her quirk, they've been acting differently. They started contacting me less, and when they do contact me they act far too nice. Not to mention they've been being even more lenient with Star and her agency. The moment that started, I knew they wanted Alice. So I managed to scrape together many of my contacts and resources, and I figured out exactly what they intended to do with Alice, and what they planned to do if I wasn't being cooperative. Needless to say, I can't allow it. Right. They plan to take away her future, and force her to do what's best for them, not her. Izuku summarized angrily. He was, wasn't surprised by any means. But he sure as hell was upset about this situation. That's unacceptable. Problem is, this isn't a situation I can easily get out of, Chol explained. The government is willing to do a lot to ensure that Alice is under their control, and given the amount of power and influence they have in the country, it's evident I can't stay in America any longer. Star sighed with dismay. Looking very distraught at that statement, and Izuku couldn't blame her. Her sister was essentially being forced out of the country, otherwise, her niece's freedom would be at risk. Izuku couldn't imagine how frustrating that must be, especially because the people doing this were the same ones she'd served for so long, and done so much for. But the issue with going to other counties is I have no guarantee that they won't try to do something similar. Chol continued. Having very few options, I called Star to see if we could brainstorm ideas for how to get out of this situation. And so when faced with this perilous situation, I knew there was only one man to call. Star said dramatically. All might. 
I told him about our situation, he advised working for you. After all, you have enough power and leverage to hold back the Japanese government if they try to do anything too heavy handed with Alice. Not to mention you live in a highly secure facility that should protect her from kidnapping, and there are a bunch of other children with super powered quirks, so she won't be treated too differently. I see. Izuku thought over it for a minute before looking at the camera with a look of pure determination. All right, you're hired. Just like that? Chol asked, only sounding slightly surprised. No interview, or screenings, or anything? Even if you couldn't perform well as a secretary, which I doubt considering your history, I'd be able to find something for you to do, Izuku told her. But really, the number one heroes of both Japan and America have asked to aid someone in desperate need of help. I'd never be able to live with myself, myself if I turned you away. Ah ha ha. See sis. I told you calling All Might was the right idea. Star laughed. Even if he can't punch the problem away, he knows good people. I suppose you're right. The relief in Chol's voice and on her face was very evident. It looked like the world had just been lifted off her shoulders. Even though they weren't necessary in the clear quite yet, it was good that they had a concrete plan in place. Thank you. Just thank you so much. You're welcome. But there is something I need to tell you. Izuku said. Currently there is an unknown group that has been trying to kill me for the past month. They seem to be solely focused on me rather than the kids, but I can't guarantee that they won't try to harm them. I've been greatly increasing the security of the house, and I've been in talks with I Island about using their technology to increase it even more, although that will take a while. We've yet to have any real leads on the group's identity, other than their quirk supremacist. I doubt your daughter would be in any real danger, as, and I am loath to say this, if they somehow got past my extensive security then the children would likely take down any attackers they send, while also protecting her from any harm. That being said, I felt like you deserved to know this information. Ah damn it there's always a catch, Star said letting out a frustrated sigh. I see, well we don't really have any other options. So that doesn't change our decision. Chol said. All right, but, in light of that, I will need you and Alice to undergo mental probing before you arrive. Izuku felt a twinge of guilt immediately after saying that. I'm deeply sorry about having to ask that of you, and even more so for asking that of your daughter. But, given her, her quirk, it's necessary. Chol gave a sigh of acceptance. Well, it's not just her quirk. Your own quirk is very dangerous in its own right. Izuku pointed out. Chol's quirk was called absolute authority. If she called out the name of someone, she could force them to do whatever she tells them. The only drawbacks was that the person needed to hear her words, and much like her daughter, she needed to know the person's name. It wasn't as powerful as her sister's quirk, but unlike Star, she didn't need to touch anything for her quirk to work. And given that A, people are actively trying to kill me, and B, I have to protect the children at all cost, I can't ignore a potential risk, Izuku told them with a guilty expression. Once I sincerely apologize Dash. That's unnecessary, Chol reassured him. If anything it's reassuring to see how protective you are. It makes me feel more confident in this plan. I never saw the issue with mental probes. If you've got nothing to hide then what's the problem? Star asked nonchalantly. Chol let out a long-suffering sigh. We are not having this conversation right now. All right, how much does Alice know about the situation? Izuku asked. Currently, not much. But I plan on telling her soon. Things are going to get very complicated, and a lot of things are going to change. So it'll be important for her to understand the stakes. Chol said. I agree. Izuku nodded, before turning to Star. Star and Stripes Dash. Just call me Cassie. After all, you're helping us out this much, it would be rude to make you refer to me by my hero name. Star told him. Ah, uh, oh okay. C-C-C-C-A Cassie. Izuku stut, her face turning red from embarrassment. Please stay with her until she gets here. 
They're going to get desperate to get Alice at any cost, especially when they learn about her leaving the country. Right, right, finally time to take those days off, Star replied. We also should move as quickly as possible. The more time we give them, the more anxious they get and the more time they have to plan and pull together their resources. Izuku said. When should I expect you here? A few weeks is the soonest I can come. Chol estimated. Right, I'll see you then, Izuku told them. Please, be careful. I will bud, Midoriya, I know I've asked a lot of you, but please promise me that if anything happens to me, you'll take care of Alice. Chol asked, almost begging. Don't say that. Izuku and Star said at the same time. You're going to get here safe, and you and Alice will be able to live in peace, relative peace, Izuku said. That's right. As your older sister, I refuse to let you think such stupid things. Star told her. Right but, I'm just being cautious. Chol once again gave him a desperate look. If something happens to me, Kas I need you to promise me you'll get Alice to Japan. And Midoriya, please, please promise me you'll take care of her in my stead, I'm begging you. Izuku looked into her eyes, and he saw the desperation of a mother, worried for her child's safety. I, I promise. I will take care of her. You have my word. Izuku told her. Thank you. Chol let out another sigh of relief. Sis? Star looked away from the camera. You're both getting to Japan safely. End of story. Sis Dash Chol let out another sigh, but this one was more disappointed than relieved. End of discussion. Star then put her hand on the computer. This computer will shut off. And with that, she left the call. Did, did she just? Izuku was in disbelief. Use her quirk to turn the computer off instead of just turning it off normally. Yes. Yes, she does that. She does that a lot. Chol sighed. She's so stubborn. Thankfully I don't need to worry about her making that promise all that much, much. If something happened to me, I know for a fact she would make sure Alice got to you, before she immediately goes back to the States, and does something stupid. My big sister is such a handful. Well um, maybe so. But at least you can say, my sister has saved thousands of lives, that's something. Izuku tried to cheer her up. Chol gave a brief chuckle before a fond smile grew on her face. Yeah, I can, thank you Midoriya. For everything. I look forward to working with you. I feel the same, Izuku said to her, giving her a kind smile. See you soon and good luck. Chol then ended the call. Leaving Izuku alone in his office. He sank back in his chair, letting go of the tension he'd been holding onto the entire conversation. Less than a year ago, he was a nobody who people deemed as so worthless that his nickname was Deku. Now he was the head of a super rich foundation, with so many children relying on him for help, and All Might contacted him to tell him that Star and Stripes and her sister needed his help. It was mind-boggling, to say the least. But he didn't get much time to process it, because suddenly Kyoko ran into his office excitedly. Kyoko you're supposed to knock. Izuku half-heartedly scolded her, mostly because he was just out of energy. Daddy I know what I want to work towards. Kyoko said a rush of pure excitement as she ran up to him and held up her arms. Oh. Izuku lifted her up on his lap. Curious about what this was about. I want to be your assistant. Kyoko told him with a sparkle in her eye that Izuku rarely saw. I want to learn how to do all that paperwork stuff, so you don't have to work as hard. And I can spend more time with you. Izuku felt his heart clench, and his face scrunched up. Daddy you're making the scrunchy face again. Kyoku gasped. That means you're happy right? Yes, sweetie. I'm very happy. Izuku said, trying to recover from the shot of wholesomeness he just got. After getting over how cute she was, and happy that made him, he, he gave her a pat on the head. All right Kyoku, you want to help me with paperwork? It's gonna take a lot of learning, and it's not very interesting work. 
I don't mind. I'll be the best assistant in the whole world. Kyoko swore, in a fashion that Izuku found absolutely adorable. Okay, well then, why don't you go play for now? And tomorrow, I'll have a lesson planned for you, okay? Izuku told her. Kyoko frowned. We can't do it right now? If you rush things, then there's a good chance you may not do it right. You have to take your time and be patient. Izuku told her before setting her down. Don't worry, you'll have plenty of time to learn, okay? Okay. Kyoku nodded. Good. Now go play, I'm sure Eri and Kay would love to spend some time with you today. Izuku told her. All right, daddy. I love you. Kyoku said. Izuku smiled at her. I love you too. Chapter 88, I am the bone of my sword. I'd like to apply for the bodyguard position. Izuku was utterly flabbergasted. He was just laying down on his bed, and his phone rang. And someone called him. And asked to apply for a job. Now, really that shouldn't be surprising, because that's really how it's supposed to go. He was only taken off guard because of the way the last bodyguard applied for the position. Oh, um. I suppose I could set up an interview. And I'll have to test your abilities. Izuku responded. Give me your name and number. I'll do a background check and I'll call you to tell you the date of the interview. Right. My name is Sai Biora. The woman on the phone explained. And my number is Dash. Wait a minute. Izuku blurted out in shock. As in, that's Sai Biora. As in the former pro hero Saber. Yes. The woman said reluctantly. The very same. I thought, I thought, uh, well I suppose testing your abilities is unnecessary then, Izuku said in utter disbelief. No, it's been a while since I was active. It would be good to make sure my abilities are still up to par. Sai insisted, her voice firm and unwavering. Well, if you insist, Izuku responded. I suppose the background check won't take as long then. Your history is well documented. I'm still going to do some research, but everything should be fine. You can come around in a couple of days, and I'll have everything set up for you by then. I see. Thank you. Sai said. XXXXXXXXXX. A few days later, Sai came into Izuku's office, for Izuku's first ever interview. Welcome, please make yourself comfortable, Izuku said gesturing to the chair opposite his desk. Thank you. Sai nodded respectfully, sitting down. Sai was relatively young for being a retired pro hero. Being only 33 and looking like she was 20. She had long blonde hair that was tied in a bun. Deep blue eyes and unblemished skin would make you think she'd never had seen battle before, if not for her calloused hands. She was wearing a black suit and a red tie. Not something you would normally see a woman in, but it fit the serious way she carried herself. Now, firstly. Why do you want to work here? Izuku asked. He'd taken yesterday to compose himself. Making sure he could be completely serious, and not fanboy in the face of the former pro hero. As you know, I was a former pro hero. I quit for, personal reasons. However I spent most of my life training to be a hero, and as such my skill set is limited. Sai admitted. This seems to just be the best use of my talents. I see. Thank you. I consider that high praise. Izuku said, forcing down a bit of giddiness. All right next, how do you feel about OPCs? I don't, I don't have feelings one way or the other. Human beings are human beings. And should be treated as such. Sai stated simply. Perfect answer. Izuku thought, smiling a bit. All right, well given how much I know about you, this interview doesn't really need to go on much longer. I suppose we should move on to the test portion of the interview. I see. Well then let's not waste time. Sai said, standing up. Please lead me to my test. 
XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Of course, Sai said, as a portal opened, and shot a sword at lightning speed, right into the Goliath's neck, killing it. After it faded away, Izuku turned to Yami. You can begin. Yami nodded and started vomiting out more goop. This time, a lot more. The goop then turned into a small army of bearing elves that surrounded Sai entirely. All right, the same rules apply as the last test, Izuku instructed. One question, Sai said before the test began. Are these things susceptible to poisons and toxins? The grim are meant to replicate living organisms. Albeit, but stronger than your typical person or animal. So yes, but they'd have to be pretty powerful. Izuku explained. I see, Sai responded. That was all. I am ready to begin. Okay. Start the test. Izuku said. Yami nodded, and a moment later, the bearing elves all charged at her. Of course, they didn't get very far, as portals opened up behind them, and a ton of short swords shot into their backs with extreme force, knocking them all the ground in an instant, leaving them at her feet. The bearing, bearing elves tried to get up, but they struggled for a bit, before stopping completely. Lying helpless on the floor. Ah, so she had poison blades as well. Kiba deduced, smirking with satisfaction. Very nice. She's taking them all out without even moving. That's so cool. Netsu said. Well. We've seen your capabilities against both tough single opponents and strong groups of opponents. Now we just need to see if you can take on something truly fearsome, which I know you can but I'm making sure. Izuku explained, trying not to make a fool of himself. Anyway, the final test has already been set up, and it starts now. And sorry for what's about to happen. Sai's eyes widened as she quickly put together what was happening, and she immediately reacted. She pulled a sword out of a portal, and quickly turned and slashed behind her. She slashed something, and saw something, she assumed it was a grim, whose darkness from the wound for a second before it closed up. Sai then heard the creature jump back, and created more portals behind it, and shot swords out at where she assumed it was. However, the swords flew right past where she thought it was, as the Grim had ducked down, with the swords flying overhead, right at Sai. Sai makes a portal in front of her, and shoots a sword out of it, deflecting the sword that was coming at her. And yet, a second later, something hit her, pushing her back and holding her against the wall. Ack! Sai cried out, as she felt a hand holding her throat and choking her. She shot another sword from below, cutting off the invisible extended arm and freeing her. It seems this one will be a lot more trouble. Sai thought. Taking things up a notch, Sai opened a ton of portals on both sides of the room and started shooting out swords pretty much everywhere. Suddenly, the hound became visible, ripped off its own head and threw it at Sai. The swords hit the hound's body, sinking into his flesh, but the head managed to slip through one of the openings between the swords. Its head flew at Sai, teeth bared at the former hero. Sai jumped back, avoiding the head as it landed on the ground. Then she watched in shock as the creature began to regenerate its body. I see. So that was the point of this exercise. Sai thought as she opened a large number of portals around the still regenerating hound. Kaboom! The swords all hit the hound, creating a huge explosion, engulfing the hound completely. Izuku and the children shielded their faces and eyes from the light and the wind that came from the blast. When the explosion died down and the smoke cleared, all that could be seen was black smoke, if now dead hound, dissipating into the air. Izuku gave melancholy smile. You killed it. You never said that the rules of the previous test applied to this one. And what's more, this opponent was one that both constantly adapted and regenerated. Sai explained calmly. It was never an opponent that one could realistically capture or non-lethally incapacitate. Or at the least most opponents would lack the means to do so. Therefore the purpose of this test was to see if I was willing to know when taking a life is necessary to protect the children. Izuku nodded, and his smile vanished. I despise the thought of killing. And if it was up to me, I would never, ever take a life. But, as a father and caretaker, my children must always come first. 
While I would never go to it as a first resort, I have to acknowledge that there are some opponents that are simply unable to be contained or captured. Therefore, I need the people charged with protecting this place to be able to do the same. Hmm. Sai closed her eyes and considered her next words. I have taken the lives of villains before. It is a very heavy decision to make. And should not be made for a shallow cause. However, protecting children. That is a cause worthy of taking a life. I see. see. Then there is no need to test you any further. Izuku said. You're hired. Sai smiled and pulled out a sword. A golden blade, with a bright blue hilt. Then I swear to you, upon my blade, I will protect you and these children. No matter the cost. Hmm. Yes, you will do quite nicely. Kiba smiled. I am happy to welcome you as part of our army. Handle our forces with care, and protect your queen and her siblings with pride. Sai gave a brief chuckle. Of course my lady. Can I keep one of the swords? Netsu asked. Unfortunately, the swords will not remain here for much longer, Sai explained. A few moments after she said that, the sword she had summoned disappeared in a bright blue light. Whoa! What happened to them? Netsu asked, running over to where the swords once were. The swords I make are not of this world. They belong to the world inside my imagination. A world of infinite swords. When I force them through the portal here, I'm forcing something that should not exist into existence. Sai explained. As such, they can only be here for a certain amount of time before they fade back into their own reality. The same goes for anything that I would drag into that world, aside from swords that is. Interesting. Well, you can tell me about the details of your quirk in our wrap-up discussion. Izuku said. Well talk about pay, accommodations, healthcare, terms. All that. Very well, let's take this back to your office sir, Sai said, as she and Izuku departed. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
and if something set him off emotionally while it was active, then it could be disastrous. I'm guessing Castor sabotaged you all, making Berserker go out of con control, which was the reason for Lancer's death. You and Berserker were known to be good friends, but considering his power, and how much damage he could do, you would have no choice but to put him down, while the other two took care of Castor. Once again, Sai remains silent. Not confirming or denying anything yet. I have no idea what became of Assassin and Archer. I presume they're still alive, and were just heavily discouraged, leaving without going through the formalities you did. Izuku said. Now as for you, I have little doubt that the events of this tragedy had shaken you a bit. But even then looking at your behavior then, and even now, I doubt that it have been enough to get you to quit outright. Something was said or revealed, or done, by someone, that either heavily damaged, or destroyed your faith in heroes outright. That's the only thing I could think of, as to why someone who spent their entire life in the pursuit of one goal, would suddenly quit. Once Izuku finished giving out his theory, there was a long, tense silence, with Sai looking down the entire time. Eventually, she pulled up her head, a serious look in her eye. It almost alarming how much of that you managed to put together. I suppose, in that case, I'll fill in the blanks. As it turns out, Castor was working with someone known as All for One. Izuku's eyes widened. All for One. Sai's eyes widened as well, seemingly shocked that Izuku knew about the mysterious villain. However her expression returned to her serious one, and she continued the story. Yes. For whatever reason, Castor was working for that villain, and when we discovered this and tried to apprehend her, Berserker suddenly attacked us and killed Lancer with a surprise attack. He didn't seem to be, himself. I don't know what Castor did, or how she did it, but somehow she was controlling Berserker, forcing him to fight us. He was too strong. Even stronger than normal. And, I killed him. Now it was Izuku who stayed silent. Giving nothing more than a sympathetic look. Not wanting to show any disrespect towards this woman's loss. As you said, Archer and Assassin took down Castor, although she was significantly stronger than normal, and she was using her quick in ways we've never seen before. Sai continued. And then after that, after that, after everything was finished I gave my briefing to the h.p.s.c, and they didn't treat Berserker's death with the respect it deserved. Ah, so that's what did it. Izuku thought. Some more things were said, and in the end, I decided I couldn't continue working for them anymore, Sai said, doing a very good job at restaining the lingering anger she felt just remembering this occurrence. And I quit. I see. Izuku gave her a saddened look. I'm sorry you had to go through all that. Berserker was a hero worthy of respect. I remember his contribution to ending the Ancicioid. It's a shame the HPSC couldn't do the same. Sai gave a sad smile, recalling the event Izuku spoke of. Yes. A shame. Another moment passed, before Sai's expression became deadly serious. When I mentioned all for one. You reacted like you knew that name. Izuku's eyes went wide again, as he realized he'd given himself away. Ah. Yeah. I suppose I did. And, I'm guessing the HPSC didn't tell you a lot about him. They denied he existed, Sai explained sternly. No matter how much I asked, and insisted to know the truth, that denied me at every step. It was part of the reason I quit. Izuku bit the side of his cheek, hesitating a bit. And I'm guessing you want me to tell you about him. Given all I've been through because of him, I think I deserve to know, Sai said. Izu Izuku sighed. Well, I can't disagree. But I need you to keep what I tell you, to yourself at all cost. It's heavily classified information, and the only reason I know all this is because of a powerful friend of mine who's not too great at keeping secrets. It's pretty much a state secret. Well no it makes a bit more sense as to why they were so amendment on keeping me in the dark, Sai said with notable disdain. I swear I will keep my lips sealed. Very well. Izuku got ready to start explaining. To put it simply, All for One is the oldest and most dangerous villains to ever have existed. Dating back to when Quirks first began to emerge. 
His quirk, all for one, allows him to steal the quirks of others and use them for himself. Or even transfer them to other people. Sai's eyes widened. Wait. Then that means dash. Caster must have been given quirks by all for one, Izuku told her. My guess is that she gained these quirks in exchange for favors. He could practically hear Sai's fist clenching, as rage bubbled up to the surface. Currently, we think he's dead, Izuku said. All Might battled the villain and smashed his face in, but the body was never found. And given that he's had a couple hundred years to gather quirks dash. It's entirely possible that he could still be alive, Sai concluded, looking mighty upset, to say the least. Right. Izuku nodded. But no one's heard anything from him since his supposed death. So either he is truly dead, or he's biding his time. Izuku knew that wouldn't be a satisfying answer. Heck, it was probably the least satisfying answer. But it was the truth, and she deserved the truth. So he's the one responsible for all this. He certainly sounds like a monster. Sai said, once again trying to contain her anger, but only barely doing so. Is it truly fine to leave his fate uncertain? Shouldn't they be doing everything in their power to make sure he's truly dead? And if not, make sure he actually dies? Probably, but up until now, All Might was certain he killed him, Izuku responded. And the HPSC is content to assume he's dead. They likely won't make a move unless they see something pointing towards him being alive. And even then. Sai let out a very frustrated sigh. Typical. Well, if he is alive, then he's bound to show up eventually. And when that happens. All Might will take care of him. That I can assure you. Izuku told her. From what you've told me, this man appears to not fear death via aging. If that's the case, then All Might may not be around to fight him. Sai pointed out firmly. Izuku nodded. We are well aware of that. However, there is a plan in place in the event that that transpires. Right now, there is a hero, being trained at UA. Who is destined to surpass All Might. If All Might can't finish him off. She will. That a lofty expectation. How are you so sure of this? Sai asked, with suspicion. Well, that secret is something I can't disclose to you. My apologies. Izuku told her. Unfortunately, that secret is not only not mine to tell, but it's also much more important to keep hidden than the existence of all for one. I'm really sorry, but I'll just need you to trust me. I see, Sai responded. Thank you. For telling me what you could. And for telling me what you couldn't. I admire your honesty, it confirms that working for you is the right choice. It's nothing to admire. You deserved some closure. Izuku told her. Now, then I'll give you till next month to gather all your stuff and bring it here. You can start working here with the other guard at the same time. Other guard? Sai asked raising an eyebrow in confusion. Oh. Izuku's eyes went wide as he realized he forgot something important. I didn't tell you about her. I'm so sorry, it must have slipped my mind. It's fine, Sai reassured him. Just tell me what she's like. Ah uh, well. Izuku tried to find the best way to word it. She's very unique. Chapter 89, Who You Are to Me Izuku, Izuku was laying in his bed, getting ready to go to sleep after a long day, when suddenly he heard a knock on the door. Who is it? Now, Izuku didn't know who could be knocking on his door this late at night. It could have been one of the girls looking for more cuddles, like Kei, Eri, or Kyoku. It could have been Yami or Fu asking for more food. It could have been his mother wanting to talk to him. Or in a worst-case scenario, it could have been Momo Ida or Achiko telling him that something terrible has happened. It's, it's me. Who Izuku did expect, probably the last person he would have expected, was Fuku. His eyes widened, and he was stunned into silence for a moment before he quickly responded. Oh. Um, see come in. 
There was a moment of silence, presumably, Fuku was hesitating before she ultimately opened the door. H. Hi. D. 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 Dash, Izuku. Fuku stuttered, before looking at the ground with a pained expression. This whole thing was, concerning to Izuku. Firstly Fuku approaching him was odd. Not bad, but definitely odd. And now this. She was definitely trying to call him dad. Which, should have pleased him, and it would have, if not for how forced it was. It was clear she had tried, and failed, to force herself to call him dad, and was clearly displeased at her inability to do so. But why was she forcing herself to call him dad in the first place? Hey Fuku. Is everything alright? Do you need anything? Izuku asked, not wanting to sound overly concerned. Sometimes that would make Fuku think she did something wrong. I'm okay. Fuku said a bit too quickly. It's just um, I was wondering, if it's not asking too much, if you could possibly, spend the day with me tomorrow. Almost immediately, Fuku closed her eyes, and held her head down putting her hands over her head and seemingly waiting to be struck or yelled at. Of course, of course. I may be a busy person, but it's my job first and foremost, to take care of you and the others. Izuku reminded her. And to make sure none of you want for anything. So if you want to spend more time with me, then I'll be happy to do so. Th thank you so much. Fuku said. I, I am really looking forward to tomorrow. I, I have a lot of things I want to de do with you. I'll be looking forward to it too Fuku, Izuku told her, giving her a kind smile. We should both get some rest, sounds like we have a big day tomorrow. Oh. Yes. Oh, could you imagine if I asked to spend time with you, and then I couldn't do anything right because I was too tired? Fuku gulped. That would be so disrespectful. It'd be fine. It happens to all of us. Izuku reassured her. But let's try and keep that from happening. Rewrite. I'll be going back to my room now. Fuku said as she shuffled back towards the door. So sorry for disturbing you. Good night. Good night, Izuku told her as she left. Once Fuku was gone, Izuku laid back down. I'll have to figure out exactly what's going on with her tomorrow. Hopefully, it's nothing too serious. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
it wasn't mind-blowing by any means. Going just above average into the pretty good tier of foods. Competently made. And while that didn't sound like much, it was still very impressive considering her complete lack of experience. People didn't tend to do well when having to do something they'd never even tried before, so for Fuku to do this well, was pretty amazing. After swallowing it, he gave Fuku a smile, and a thumbs up. It was probably the best way he could handle it. Too much praise in Fuku would think he was lying, and too little in Fuku would think she didn't do well enough. It was a tricky balance to reach using words, so perhaps a gesture would be better suited. And judging by Fuku's sigh of relief, before she dug into her own food. The two of them enjoyed their meal together for a bit, but Izuku felt the need to fill the silence. So, have you given any thought to what you want to do in the future? Izuku asked her. Both to make conversation and because he was genuinely curious. Any plans? An ideal career? Anything? Fuku paused for a moment, before swallowing her food and giving Izuku a nervous look. Um, I, I want to do something, creative. Everyone tells me that I'm really good at de-drawing and writing. A and I know how to sew and cook too. S so I think I could probably be a good author. Or artist, or dressmaker, or a cake decorator. I if that's okay. Of course, it is, Izuku told her. No matter what job you choose, I will always support you, and try to help you achieve your dreams. Although, I didn't know that you wrote. The moment Izuku said that Fuku's whole body went stiff, and her pupils shrunk as she made the deer in headlights expression. Telling Izuku that she probably said that part by accident and didn't even realize it. I mean, I do but. Fuku looked down at her plate, her face bright red, and beads of sweat dripping down her face. You don't want to show it to me, Izuku said, figuring that out rather quickly. Please don't be mad. Fuku begged, almost immediately. I, I'll show it to you if you really want, but Fu's the only person that thinks it's good as Mu, and that might be because he's the only person who's read it besides me, but I think it's really terrible and kind of cringe and dash. Fuku's it's alright. Izuku had a feeling he would be saying that a lot today. I told you before, I'll try not to force you to do anything you're uncomfortable with. If you don't want to show me your writing, then you don't have to. But, you're supposed to be my, my, my DD dad, Fuku said, managing to force herself to call him dad, although that didn't seem to make her any happier, in fact, her calling him dad seemed to make her mood even worse, as she looked down on at her plate with an intensely guilty expression. I should be able to share anything with you. Izuko sighed and gave her a sad look. Unfortunately, we haven't had much time to bond. One of the downsides of my job is that I can't spend time with all you kids at once. And some will call for more of my attention, meaning that it can leave my bond with certain children a bit, lacking. I've been content to let Ari and Kay help you out with your, difficulties, and I do think that was the right decision, but as a result, you are one of the children I've spent the least amount of time with, unfortunately. But hopefully, we can fix that today. Fuku paused for a moment, before giving her pancakes a determined pout. Why yeah. We'll fix that. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X. After finishing up their breakfast, the two moved on to the first activity Fuku had planned for today. A game of catch. Izuku and her were currently in the backyard, with Izuku holding the ball, looking mighty confused. Are you sure you want to do this? Izuku asked her. I never figured you were one for catch. Why yeah well why you know I just want to try new things, Fuku told him. Her constantly shifting eyes and nervous expression, even more nervous than normal that is, gave her away. Lying was not her strong suit. But Izu Izuku decided not to call her out just yet. He had to be careful when dealing with Fuku, he couldn't be too aggressive. Alright, but if you don't feel like you're having fun, we can stop anytime you like, Izuku told her, before raising up his arm. Are you ready? Fuku got a good distance away from Izuku, before looking around, getting nervous, and walking a bit closer, and then repeating this process, a few more times, until she found a spot close enough to Izuku, but also far enough that he could reasonably throw it at her. O oh, equals okay. Do it. Alright, here goes. 
Izuku threw the ball at her softly, not too hard, but just hard enough to reach her. However, instead of catching it, Fuku's eyes dilated in fear, before she ducked down, and putting her hands in front of her face. Please no! The ball flew over Fuku's head, landing a few feet behind her. Ha! Huh? Fuku seemed to snap out of whatever had taken over at the moment and realized what she'd done. Oh no I messed up. Fuku, are you sure you want to do this? Izuku asked again. You looked like you were scared for your life there. I'm sorry. Sometimes F.A., that man, would throw stuff at me when he got really angry so I just kind of did this on instinct. Izuku couldn't hide his disgust after hearing that, as he once again wondered how any parent could do that to their child. However, Fuku, being Fuku, took Izuku's disgusted expression the wrong way, and almost started crying. I'm sorry. Please don't be mad, I won't do it again I swear. The moment Izuku heard that he cursed himself for not reining himself in, and letting himself forget his present company. Wait Fuku, I wasn't mad at you. I was just upset at your old father for doing that to you. I'm sorry. No really it was my fault I should have prepared myself better since I knew that I got used to doing that when things were thrown at me. Fuku argued. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have to apologize for something like that, if anything it's my fault for not having noticed that after all this time. Izuku countered. But you're so busy all the time, how could anyone blame you for that? I was the one who said we should play catch and completely forgot about the fact that I'm like this. Fuku rebuked. This continued for quite some time, but after eventually deciding to just drop the subject, Izuku said they should probably abandon catch for now. And so they moved on to the next part of Fuku's activity list. Bike riding. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
although they were to stay out of sight, as to not stress out Fuku with their terrifying appearance. And what were the two of them doing in the forest? Fishing. Yes, the two of them were sitting by a lake with some fishing rods, waiting for some fish to show up. Suddenly, Fuku felt a pull on her line. I, I got a bite. Oh. Reel it in. Izuku encouraged her. Fuku stood up and started reeling in the line, however, the fish seemed to be pretty heavy, and she had to try and pull it out, but that didn't seem to do much as Fuku struggled to try and pull it up. Izuku helped her out, grabbing her arms and helping her out. Come on we can do it. Air. Ack. Fuku and Izuku finally pulled the fish out, curling it into the air as it flopped around, startled by being taken out of the water. Izuku caught the fish as it came back down, and held it as it flopped around in his arms. Wow, this is a pretty big one. Great job Fuku. Fuku was absolutely beaming as Izuku put the fish in the bucket with all the other ones they'd caught. So far, the fishing had been doing swimmingly. Much better than the other two activities. They did have to look up some YouTube videos to figure out how to fish, fish, and after a couple failures, they started to get it down. And even the waiting process was very enjoyable, it was peaceful, and the feeling of reeling a fish, which she would later then cook, was amazing. She could actually see this becoming a hobby of hers. Maybe she'd listen to some podcasts next time. Although she didn't mind the peaceful silence there was now. Seeing the peaceful smile on Fuku's face made Izuku's heart feel full. It was such a rare thing to see her so at ease. Well, he himself didn't really see her like this much, considering most of the time she only went out wearing her hoodie. However, Izuku had something else on his mind as well. Fuku had been acting weird this entire time, and now that she was at ease, Izuku felt it was finally time to confront her. Fuku. Izuku broke the silence. Hmm. Fuku looked at him curiously. Are you going to tell me what this all about? Izuku asked her. Fuku tilted her head and gave him a confused look. What? You suddenly asking to spend time with me, while in no way unwelcome, is odd. Not bad. Just odd. Izuku explained to her. And then there's all the times you kept forcing yourself to try and call me dad. Then today you had us do a bunch of stereotypical activities you'd see someone do with their father on TV or in a movie. None of which you're familiar with. Something is obviously up with you, and as your caretaker or as your father if you prefer, I need to know what it is, and if I should be concerned. Please, be honest with me. Fuku's face fell, a saddened expression overtaking her, as she once again looked away from him and down at the lake. Staring at their reflections. After a few moments of silence, she finally worked up the nerve to answer. I, I want Ari and Kay to be my sisters. I mean, they might already think of me as their sister, I think they've called me that a few times but, I want it to be official. But for that, I need you to be my, to be my dad. But I, I just can't think of you as my father. Fuku. Izuku looked at her with a saddened expression. Not because of the whole can't think of you as my father thing that stun a little, but he was more so upset because this was clearly eating her up inside. A and I don't know why. Fuku shouted, tears of frustration welling up in her eyes. I like you. You are a really good person who's done so, so much for me and the people I care about. You've given me everything I ever wanted and things I didn't even know I wanted. And you even worked yourself to the point of getting sick just for us. But whenever I try to think of you as my father I feel, I feel sick. I feel like I want to throw up and I don't know why. What's wrong with me? Fuku was really crying now, although softly, her tears falling into the lake as did so. I'm sorry. I thought that maybe if we spent more time together, then I'd be able to think of you as my father no problem but, I still feel gross when I try to think of you that way. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry, I don't know why I feel like this. There was a few moments of silence between them. The only sound in the whole area was the noise Fuku's tears made as they hit the water. But eventually, Izuku responded. What is the definition of father to you? 
Ha! Huh? Fuku was confused by the question. Or rather why he asked that out of the blue. I asked, what is the definition of a father to you? Izuku repeated. If you were to guess, what would be the dictionary definition of the word father? Oh um, a man who takes care of his children and helps them grow? Fuku guessed, unsure of where Izuku was going with this, this. All right. But when you think of the word father or dad, what do you think of? Izuku asked her. What comes to your mind first? Please be honest. Fuku paused for a moment before deciding to trust Izuku and start thinking about the word father. Almost instantly she was struck by a memory of her own father yelling at her. Another memory of him hitting her. Another memory of him tying her to a chair. Fuku winced, almost as if she'd been stuck. Giving Izuku his answer. You keep thinking of him don't you, Izuku said. I, yes, Fuku admitted. And therein lies the problem, Izuku told her somberly. That man has ruined the term father for you. When you think of a father, you don't think of a man who cares for and supports you. You think of a terrible person who mistreats and abuses you. But but I know that's not what a father's supposed to be like. Fuku argued, a horrified and desperate look in her eyes. You know that up here. Izuku pointed to her head, before moving his finger down towards her heart. But not down here. The heart and mind can often disagree. Even if you know something is true, it may take a while before you ever accept it. Sometimes people simply don't and let themselves go on believing lies because they can't bring themselves to accept the truth. Even if they want to. But I dash Fuku's tears started picking up speed. Her hands tightened around her fishing rod, and she clamped her eyes shut. I I dash. Suddenly, Fuku got another bite. I ga hey -a. Fuku shouted out in rage and frustration, startling Izuku who was not expecting such an outburst. Fuku started reeling in the line furiously. Doing so, so hard Izuku was concerned she might break it. Damn him. Damn that horrible horrible man. Even when he's not here he's still running my life. I hate him. I hate him. I hate him. The furious girl leaned back and pulled the fish out of the water, water, once again causing it to go flying into the air. Izuku grabbed it before it could hit the ground and looked back at Fuku, who was now panting with exhaustion after her outburst. If I, if I can't think of you as a father, that means Miyari and Kate can't be real sisters. Fuku cried. That's not true, Izuku told her softly, but firmly, causing her to give him another confused look. Yes, normally two people would have to share a parent of some kind to considered siblings. But that doesn't have to be the case. Ha! Huh? Fuku continued to be baffled by what Izuku was saying. Many people will call each other sisters or brothers, regardless of their parent situation, Izuku explained. Sure to some people being a blood sibling or a step sibling is all there is, but for others, it's simply the next evolution of friends. People so close to you, they might as well be family. And really, what's to stop you from calling them, you sisters? They won't. I certainly won't. At that point, you only need to ask yourself, do you want to call them your sisters? Yes. Of course, I do. Fuku said, a hopeful glint in her eyes. Well, then it's settled. Izuku put his hand on her head and gave her a reassuring smile. You three are sisters. And you can be sisters with Kiba, Kyoku, any other part of our family. Even if you can't think of me as a dad. B but that's just, weird. Fuku pointed out. This is a foundation for overly powerful children, run by a quirkless 16-year-old. Whose first employee was hired after breaking and entering on our property, and destroying our security system. Izuku chuckled. A lot of things are weird here. I guess, are you sure it's fine if I can't think of you as a father? Fuku asked. To be honest, Given what you think of when you think of a father, the fact that you can't think of me as one is a compliment, Izuku told her. There's no need to worry about me forcing things on you. 
especially not something like that, that. The only things I'll ever really insist on is that you take care of yourself and don't hurt others. That's really all you want from me? Fuku asked. That's all, Izuku confirmed. I, I see. Fuku said, trying to take that in. Because it really was hard for her to understand not having expectations placed on her. She just wasn't used to it. But it was overwhelmingly relieving. The two of them sat in silence once again. Enjoying the feeling of the sun beaming warmly down on the two of them. And thus, Fuku gained peace of mind and a new hobby. So all and all, a pretty day for her. Chapter 90, Cupid Candy Chaos Part 1 Hmm. Yami looked at the picture on Mina's phone, that being a xenomorph from an alien. Have to make some changes. Not enough bones, but could make it. Mina's smile widened, she had come to Yami's room to see if he could make this movie monstrosity, and it seemed like there in fact hope. Knock knock. Come in, Yami said. The door opened, and Shiroku came in, bringing Amai behind her. Yami, I brought you, friend, here, Shiroku told him politely. Hey Yami. Amai greeted him cheerfully. I came for our trip to lighting up the city. Ever since Yami and Amai had gone to the city that one time to give people joy candies, they had decided they would do this every now and then. Today the two had decided to just that, with Izuku's approval, although they would have to decide on who would supervise them. You have candies? Yami asked. Amai nodded and opened her basket, showing off all the mood candies that were inside. However, something was off about them. Yami took one of the candies and noticed that it was pink rather than yellow. Different color. Amai's eyes widened as she realized what had happened and saw Yami about to eat one. Wait Yami don't. But it was too late, he had already popped one in his mouth. The moment, moment he did he felt a wave of warmth wash over him, a pleasant feeling that washed over all his other emotions. He looked up at Amai and then suddenly he couldn't stop. Now he liked Amai. She was his first friend, not a sibling or whatever Ken and Nara were to him, and she was very pleasant to be around. But for whatever reason, he liked her significantly more now. Just seeing her gave him a happy feeling, and he was really glad she was here. Also, she was just very nice to look at. She was just very pretty, and her bright blonde hair just radiated joy and that adorable red blush was also adding to his desire to keep looking at her. However looking past that, he could see that she seemed to be distressed. That bothered him. It really, really bothered him. Upset. What's wrong? Yami said, getting really close to her and looking her in the eyes. T those were love candies. Amai stuttered as her face turned as red as a tomato. I must have accidentally made those instead of happy candies. Love candies? Mina and Shiruko's interest was piqued. Like candies that make you fall in love? Mina grinned, getting several ideas already. Shiruku was in the exact same boat. Is that why Yami can't look away from you right now? Did he fall in love with you? Yami tired his head. Love? Was he in love with Amai right now? This feeling was certainly similar to how he felt about Izuku but different. It was love, but a different kind of love. Still, he didn't have the urge to kiss her or anything like he saw in fiction. He was just very fond of her right now. And thought she was very pretty. No nothing like that. Amai shook her head flusteredly. The love candy boosts the affection you feel towards the first person you see. But it doesn't have to be romantic. It can be the love you feel for a parent, or a sibling, or a friend. Wayami probably just thinks I'm a very good friend right now, now. Hmm. Yami hummed. That seemed accurate. That doesn't explain why he's looking at you like that, Shiroku said with a smug look. I just think she's very pretty, Yami answered honestly. Amai made a high-pitched whining noise, as her face somehow got even redder. I know exactly what to do with these, Mina said, staring at the basket with a mischievous gleam in her eye. 
I think we have the same idea, Shiroku said with a creepy grin. Amai looked at them nervously. Whatever you planning, please don't. The power of love can do terrible things in the wrong hands. Oh come on, we're not gonna do anything that bad. Just some pranks. Mina said. Lighten up a bit. No one's gonna get hurt. Yeah we'd never hurt anyone here, you know that. We're just gonna have some fun. Shiroku said. And see some ship sail. Hmm. Am I still looked unsure? Please. I'll make you a dress. Free of charge. Shiruku pleaded. And I'll give you. Mina fished around in her pocket before taking out some cash. One thousand yen. Amai hesitated for a second but eventually took the money. Deal. Shiruku swiped the basket and she and Mina looked at the candies with glee. By the way, how long does the effect last? Mina asked. Well how long the effect of my candies last, depends on how I was feeling at the time I made them, and how hard it is to shake off that emotion, Amai explained. Love is super powerful, so it takes a while for it to wear off, it'll probably last for a few hours. Neat. This is gonna be super fun. Mina said. Come on girl. Let's go play Cupid. I can't wait. Shiruku responded as the two left the room to start their spree of terror. XXXXXXXXXX. You know I kind of wish Ryu Q was in this game, Achiko said. Achiko and Izuku of them were currently in Izuku's room, sitting on his bed playing superhero bash together. Izuku was once again playing All Might, and since Ryu Q was in fact not in the game, nor her actual favorite hero 13, Achiko was playing Mirko. I mean, I understand why 13 isn't in here, she's a rescue hero, but Ryukyu is a combat hero, Achiko argued. Yeah, it would be really cool to play as her, but how would she even work? Izuku asked while playing the game. I mean she's a massive dragon. I can't imagine how you would design a playable character like that. I mean couldn't they shrink her down? Achiko counted. Izuku shook his head. I think a lot of Ryukyu's power and intimidation factor comes from her size, it would be like trying to shrink down into lady. I just don't think it would be a good idea. Achoko sighed. I mean I guess. I just wish there were more female heroes in the game. I agree. Izuku nodded. Knock knock. Come in, Izuku said. Mina came into the room with a grin that was a bit too wide. Hey, guys. Hanging out. Mina asked. Glad to see you're getting some R&R. Yeah, it's been a while since I got to lay back and play video games. Izuku smiled back at her. Thank you for all the help, by the way. No problem. Mina waved it off. Hey Oka, um I just showed up and brought some joy candies. You want one? Mina offered Achiko a love candy, which she had covered in edible paint, courtesy of tricking Momo, to make it look like a joy candy. Oh, thanks, Mina, Achiko said, taking the candy. Welp guess I better go. See ya. Mina quickly got out of the room, her grin widening as she exited. Ha! Huh. That was weird. Achiko shrugged as she popped the candy into her mouth, before turning to Izuku. So what were we dash? Achoko froze. Izuku was smiling. This was no surprise to her, Izuku had been smiling for a while now since they'd started playing. And she was very relieved to see him genuinely smile once again. But for whatever reason, right now it was making her heart skip a beat. She just couldn't look away from his face right now. His dark green, messy hair, his deep green eyes, all complemented his smile perfectly. It was so bright, it was like staring at an emerald sun. Then Izuku turned his head and looked at her. And their eyes met. And so they stared at each other for a bit, until Izuku started to blush intensely, causing Achiko to blush as well as she realized she was being really weird for whatever reason. You um, so what were we talking about? Izuku quickly turned his head away, his face now super bright red. I uh, 
Ah. For some reason Achiko couldn't pull herself together, she barely managed to tear her eyes away from Azuku, and she couldn't even remember what they were talking about mere seconds ago. I I I don't remember. Oh. W well it probably wasn't very important. Izuku responded. S so how are you, parents? Achiko paused. For a moment she managed to get past the love candies effect and think about her parents and Izuku. A gentle smile came to her face as she recalled her last few visits to her parents' new house. They've been great. Better than ever. Thanks to you. Ah well, I only did what any good friend would do. Izuku's blush deepened. Achiko actually laughed at that, even though her heart was beating much faster for some reason. Friends spend stupid amounts of money to get their friends' parents' work, even though they're almost on the other side of the country? I don't think so. What you did was beyond helpful. Finally, they don't have to wake up in the morning and figure out which meal they have to sacrifice to save money. Or spend all day having to make calls to try and find work. Or any of the other thousand stupid things we had to suffer through because we didn't have money. Now they can just be happy. You have no idea how much that means to me. Honestly, I'm so happy I could kiss you I dash. She fro froze. The moment she realized what came out of her mouth, she froze, and her face got so red, she was worried she might pass out with all the blood going to her cheeks. And Izuku was in the same boat. <laughs> Achiko screamed internally. Why did I say that? I mean I wouldn't mind kissing him, but wait. What am I thinking? We're just friends. Just very, very, very close friends. The closest friends. Friends for life. Oh God, why does that feel wrong? What is happening? Wait a minute. I only started feeling weird after Mina gave me that mood candy. She must have something to do with this. I knew that her smile was a bit too wide. Oh when I get my hands on her I'm going to. Knock knock. Suddenly there was someone else knocking on the door, interrupting Achiko's inner monologue. Unfortunately, had crashed so he wouldn't be responding for a little bit. See come in. Achiko responded, hoping that this could break up the weird tension in the room. Todoroki came into the room, looking stoic as normal. He took one look at Izuku, who was still frozen, and completely out of it. Yurarika, is Midoriya all right? Why yeah he's fine, Achiko said. Right Izuku? Izuku didn't respond. Achiko reached down and grabbed Izuku's hand, shaking him a bit. Hey, Izuku. Izuku jolted into alertness the moment their hands met. Ha, huh, what? Ha? Huh? Midoriya? Todoroki said, to get his attention. Ha? Huh? Todoroki? Izuku finally became aware of his surroundings again, although the blood rushing to his face was not helping him reorganize his thoughts. WH what did you need? Sorry I was a bit out of it. I could see that. Todoroki noticed. Anyway, I have the sudden urge to see my sister. I don't know why, but I want to. I wanted to ask permission to go home and see her for a day. Oh that's fine. Izuku approved. Go ahead. Todoroki nodded and took his leave, closing the door behind him and leaving the two alone together again. There was an, an awkward silence that permeated the room for a few minutes as the two sat in silence with completely red faces. Eventually, Izuku broke the silence. So um uh, why your hand is still on mine? Achiko's eyes widened, and she realized that her hand was in fact still touching Izuku's, and she quickly pulled it away. Sorry. It's, it's fine, Izuku responded, looking away from her. Um, I have to go do something real quick. Achiko said, practically jumping from the bed to the door, so fast you'd swear she was using full cowling. See ya. Achiko left the room in a hurry, ready to go murder her pink classmate. X X X X X X X X X X. I don't understand how you don't understand this. 
Nara admonished her brother. It's a simple equation. You're calling this simple. Ken held up the book they were working in. This is a monster equation. Look how stupidly long it is. Are we ever going to actually use this in life? The two siblings were currently in the library, with Nara tutoring her less academically gifted brother, with great difficulty. You might have to use to determine something important later as a hero. You never know? Nara said, frustration sinking into her voice. Also, you have to know this stuff to get into a hero school in the first place. That's so lame. Ken groaned as he leaned back in his chair. Why do things have to be so complicated? It's really not. Nara scoffed, rolling her eyes at her brother's overdramatic behavior. Ken glared at his sister. Easy for you to say miss know-it-all. Nara was about to give a scathing rebuttal when Shiroka scuttled. Hi, Shiroka said, before dropping the candy in front of Ken and then leaving. Both siblings watched her go and then kept their eyes on the door she just left from, confused as to what just happened. Okay, that was weird, Ken said, not hesitating too much in popping the candy into his mouth. Yeah, weird. Nara squinted at the candy with a look of suspic suspicion. Ken are you sure you should be eating that? Ken shrugged. Candy is candy. If she gave it to me, I'm gonna eat it. Nara sighed. Fine. Let's just get back to work. Ken groaned and looked back at his sister, however something seemed off. He couldn't muster the same feeling of annoyance that he did usually, and instead, he was focused on how determined she looked. Uh, sure. Whatever. Despite Nara's best efforts, Ken couldn't really focus too much on the work itself. Rather, ironically, he was more focused on how hard she was trying to tutor him. How much effort she put into trying to make him understand the things on the page. It made him feel like a dick for being so dismissive and rude earlier. This distraction did not go unnoticed by his sister, however. All right what's going on, Nara said, putting down the book and giving her brother a frustrated look. You've been giving me weird looks for the past half hour. I don't know, Ken said, blushing as he turned his head away from his sister. It's just, you're working really hard to try and teach me this, huh? Nara raised an eyebrow. Yeah. Obviously. Not like it's easy to get all this through your thick skull. Ken sighed. I guess, sorry for all the unnecessary comments, I guess. It's just, this is really frustrating and really, really boring and I'm just venting out you even if you don't deserve it. Nara gave him a dumbfounded look, just staring at him in shock and confusion for a bit before expression shifted to that of concern. A are you okay? Aside from feeling like a jerk, yes, Ken said sarcastically, before lightly hitting the side of his head. Here I go again. It's like the only way I know how to handle frustration and anger is with rude and sarcastic comments. Ken saw side, putting his head down on the table. I don't get it. Why do go so far for me? I wouldn't say this is going so far, Nara said, started to get really concerned about her brother's suddenly odd behavior. I'm not just talking about this, Ken told her, picking his head up and looking her in the eyes. I'm talking about everything. All the times you stood up for me in front of mom and dad, and at school, and you even came with me when D.O.C. took me away. And in return, I treat you like garbage. I? Ken paused again, his frustration and anger fading, into a sad, somber expression, as he looked down at his omnitrix. I almost suffocated you in your sleep. Ghost Freak almost suffocated me in my sleep. Nara corrected him firmly. Stop that, Ken told her weakly. Even now you still defending me. Pretending that Ghost Freak is some separate person that takes over my body. He's not. It's me. It was all me. All being Ghost Freak does is make me angrier. It was still me choking you. Because at the time, I wanted to do it. Even after all you did for me, all because I was jealous. Jealous? Nara questioned. She'd never heard about this before. You were jealous? 
Ken paused again, before answering. Yeah, I was jealous. How could I not be? You were always so much, better than me. Or at least everyone always seemed to think that. You were smarter than me and more popular than me, and whenever something went wrong, it was never your fault. Always mine. They'd always accuse me. And I, I know it's not your fault. I know that. But I just kept feeling this, this anger bubble up for you, that didn't deserve. And I always knew you did, didn't deserve it, and that just made me even angrier. He paused again, and Nara just sat there and processed all this new information, with a thoughtful, yet concerned expression. But you were all I had. Ken continued. And you knew that. That's why no matter how many times I told you to go away, you stuck around. And, thank you for that. I can just never say this for some reason, but thank you. I don't know why that's so hard, but it is. And it makes me wonder why you put up with me, and when you're going to have enough one day. Don't talk like that idiot. Nara scolded him. I told you didn't I? I'm not leaving you alone. That's an easy thing to say, but we all know how unbearable I get, Ken told her. I don't even really have a right to complain as much as I do. Have heard about what happened to the other people living here? What happened to Ari? I just, ugh. Is that why you've been avoiding her? Nara had been meaning to ask him about that for quite some time now, and it seemed like she was finally gonna get her answers. I just, can't stand to be in the same room as her. Ken sight looking a bit guilty. She went through all that, and she doesn't complain, or get angry, or anything. And I get upset whenever Izuku makes me eat vegetables. It just doesn't feel right. Nara winced a bit, knowing the feeling, or at least part of it. When she'd heard about Eri's background she felt a lot of things. Horror. Disgust. Anger. Pity. But she also felt, small. Nothing she ever went through would compare to what Eri experienced. And so how could she complain, or want for something, when in the same room as a person who literally died multiple times, via having her body ripped apart on a molecular level? It almost felt uncomfortable to be in the same room as her, because all she wanted to do was apologize to the poor girl for every everything she'd been through. Even if she seemed mostly fine right now. Honestly, Eri could stab her with that horn, and she'd still feel sorry for her. And she didn't really know to handle these feelings. But she did know that Eri herself wouldn't want to be treated any differently, so she tried to keep everything the same with her, emphasis on try. But now wasn't the time to think about that. Right now Nara had to worry about whatever was going on with Ken. Clearly, something had been done to him. No doubt thanks to that strange candy Shiroku had left. And Nara was definitely going to have a long discussion about not drugging her brother without her permission but that candy didn't put these thoughts in her brother's head. It just brought them to the forefront, and finally made him admit all this to her. And now that she knew about it, being the good sister that she was, she had to fix it. Listen, just because someone else has been through something worse than you, that doesn't mean everything you've been through doesn't matter, Nara told him. The two of us, you especially, have been through the ringer. And we've suffered our fair share. It's fine to be angry or upset about what happened to you. Maybe you could be a bit less of a jerk about it, but overall, some people have responded to what we've been through, way worse than you have. At least you're not trying to use a sucky childhood as an excuse to hurt people. You're saying I haven't hurt you? Ken asked skeptically. Not in any way that's mattered to me. Nara shook her head. Do you remember back a couple years ago, when that boy tried asking me out, and then got way too pushy after I rejected him? Ken's face contorted in disgust. Oh yeah, that creep. Ugh. And do you remember what you did when you saw him trying to hold my hand? Nara asked with a slight smirk. I, trans I transformed into four arms and threw him to the other side of the playground. Ken chuckled for a second before grimacing as he recalled what happened next. Then I almost got expelled, and mom and dad beat the crap out of me. Right. It was stupid, it was beyond unnecessary. Nara smiled at him. 
and a genuinely sweet. You're not a bad person, Ken. Far from it. You just have some issues. And if you have that much of a problem with yourself, instead of mopping, you can actually improve yourself. Easier said than done. Ken sighed. Yeah, but you're not alone. And I don't just mean me. Nara pointed out. Izuku genuinely cares about us and will do everything in his power to help. So if you want to do something about yourself, asking him and me for help is a good way to start. Ken didn't respond for a bit. Taking a moment to think over what Nara had told him, before smiling at her. Thanks, sis, I, seriously what is up with me right? I think it had something to do with that suspicious candy Shiroka put in front of you with no explanation, and that you ate without absolutely hand hesitation, Nara told him. I swear if she drugged me with candy, I'm gonna kick her spider butt. Ken said, getting up and running out of the library to look for the six-legged girl. Nara sighed and laid her head down. He's such a handful. Still, I should probably tell Izuku about this. He should know stuff like this when gets us a therapist. Whenever that's happening. Feeling tried, Nara decided it was best to go to bed. Which was probably for the best. If Shiroku was going to start messing around with more of those candies, she had a feeling things were gonna get chaotic, real quick. Chapter 91, Cupid Candy Chaos Part 2 Oh Fuku! EAP! Fuku jumped after suddenly hearing Mina's voice on the other side of the door, quickly closing her laptop and cutting her writing session short. M. Mina. That's right. Mind letting me in? I have a present for you. Mina said in a sing-song voice. A pre present? Fuku thought about what Mina could possibly want to give her. I is it acid to the face. Oh come on Fuku you should know me by now. I'd never hurt a hair on your head. Mina told her. Does that mean you'd hurt everything but my hair? Fuku asked, holding onto her messy hair. You know what I mean. I'm not gonna hurt you. Trust me. Ari and Kay have said good things about me right? That has to mean something. Mina pointed out. Well, they do say good things about you. Fuku reasoned. I, I guess I could let you in. And so hesitantly, Fuku opened up the door and allowed Fuku into her room. Hey, Fuku. I don't have much time because I'm trying to give these out to a bunch of people, but I have some special candy for you. Mina told her, putting a piece of candy in her hand. Oh. That sounds good. Fuku was about to eat it when Mina stopped her. Wait. Don't eat it now. Eat it in front of the mirror. Mina told her, as she ushered the child over the mirror. Fuku stood in front of the mirror and gave Mina a confused look. Why? Just trust me. And make sure you're looking directly at yourself when you eat it. Mina told her, as she stood off far to the side. Go ahead. It'll be great. Fuku gave Mina a suspicious look and considered not doing it before also considering that that might anger Mina. And in fear of that, she just decided to do what she told her. She looked directly into the mirror and put the candy in her mouth. After chewing it for half a minute and swallowing, she kept wondering why Mina was so insistent. I don't see anything different. It's just my adorable self, wait what? Fuku's eyes widened. Where did that thought come from? Since when did I think I was cute? I'm not cute. I'm not supposed to be cute, but. She took a closer look at herself in the mirror and noticed that despite, despite not changing in appearance one bit she looked different somehow. Her messy purple hair, her eyes, her face, her small stature, all of it now seemed cute to her. She looked cute. Fuku smiled in the mirror as she admired herself, feeling a wonderful sensation push its way into her heart and her head and pushed out many of her negative thoughts. Mina also smiled as she watched Fuku run her hand through her hair, knowing her plan had worked. I wonder if I would look cuter if I styled my hair, Fuku muttered to herself absent-mindedly. 
Mina wanted so badly to just dress Fuku up, do her hair, cover her in accessories. Make the girl feel as pretty as she actually was for as long as the candy's effect lasted. Let her love herself the way she should. But she had other things to do, however, she knew someone who could take her place. Hey, why don't you go see Toru? She has a lot of cute stuff that I know she'd love to dress you up in. And I know you'd look just the cutest. Mina told her. Hey, are you sure she'd be okay with that? Fuku asked. Why wouldn't she? I'm sure she'll love you when she gets to know you. Mina told her. Why wouldn't she? You're cute, talented, and a really good girl. Fuku blushed from all the praise being heaped on her but couldn't help the huge grin from growing on her face. Normally when people said stuff like this, she doubted them, though they were lying, denied it. But right now, she didn't feel like she was wrong. She was, at least in her eyes, cute. She had talents. She believed she was a good person. The Fuku in the mirror was not the one she knew. This was, better Fuku. SHE was better Fuku. And she wanted to see just how much better she could get. Oh, okay. I'll go see her. Fuku said, running to go get her hoodie, she quickly put it on and left her room to look for the invisible girl. Mina smiled and patted herself on the back. Good job, Mina. Good job. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Hey, uh, Jiro, you okay? Kaminari asked. You've been looking at me weird for a while. I know I'm handsome but dash. It's not like that idiot. Jiro snapped, her face turning red after realizing what she'd been doing, and hearing Kaminari's response. She quickly turned back to mopping the floor, this time more furiously than before. That damn idiot thinks he can say shit like that because he's good looking. Wait. Where the hell did that come from? Since when did I think that idiot was good looking? I mean, he never looked bad. And his costume's pretty cool. But he's too much of an idiot to be good looking. Even if it is kind of cute sometimes seriously what's going on? Jiro's face seemed to want to stay that shade of bright red, as her chest felt funny in ways that made her freak the hell out. So much so, that she wasn't paying attention to what she was doing, and slipped over a puddle of blood. Ah! Kaminari reacted almost instantly, rushing forward and diving toward her, la landing on the ground behind her, and letting her fall on his back. Gotcha! It took Jiro a second to realize what exactly had happened, but when she did her face was even redder, and immediately got off of him, and scowled at the boy. What the hell was that? Well I couldn't catch you in time, so this was the only other option, Kaminari explained as he got up, and saw that his shirt was now covered in blood. Ah uh, great. What did you think would happen when you slid across a bloody floor? Jiro scoffed, crossing her arms and turning away from him. Well I am supposed to do, let a pretty girl get covered in blood? Kaminari winked at her and put up some finger guns, not a chance. Somehow, Jiro's face went even redder. I you son of a ga. Jiro turned around and stabbed Kaminari in the arm with her jacks. Ow. Oh. What was that for? Kaminari cried out in pain, rubbing the spot on his arm where she stabbed him. That's what you get for saying stupid things you don't mean. Jiro huffed. What are you talking about? Kaminari gave her a confused look. Calling me pretty. We both know I'm not exactly the most attractive girl in class. Jiro pouted, looking down at her chest. Don't give girls false compliments, it's a good way to get slapped. But I wasn't lying I think you're pretty. Even if you have no tits Al. Kaminari cried as Jiro stabbed him in the arm again. Alright dumbass, then exactly about me is so pretty. Jiro asked him angrily. For some reason, her heart was racing with anticipation. Well that's, hmm. Kaminari took a good hard look at her, causing Jiro to blush even harder and look away again. Hmm. I don't know. I guess your fashion sense is great. And there was the disappointment. Jiro didn't hate it how much her heart dropped when he said that. Really? My fashion sense? Great to know I'll just be absolute absolutely disgusting to look at if I let my dad choose my clothes. I don't know okay. It's hard to explain why you're pretty, you just, are? Kaminari shrugged. It's just something about you that's kinda, attractive. The way you talk, move, everything you do is just so, you. And I kinda think that's awesome. Maybe that's it. Once again, Jiro felt her heart do things she didn't want it to do. It was a weird compliment and definitely not a conventional one, but that made it all the more genuine. Kaminari really thought she was attractive, and she did not like how much she liked that. TCH. Don't think too hard about it, your brain might crash. Jiro muttered. Hey, are you alright? Your face has been like, super red ever since you ate that candy. Kaminari pointed out. Jiro's eyes widened as she realized that Kaminari was actually right. Whatever was happening, these weird feelings only started appearing when she ate that candy. Which could only mean one thing. Give one second, I a spider I need take care of, Jiro said, dropping her broom and started running out the room after Shiruku. Ha! Huh. Guess she really hates spiders. Kaminari shrugged. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X Kiba was walking back to her room from the kitchen when she walked past Toru's room and overheard something interesting. Oh my god, Fuku you look so cute. She heard Toru squeal. 
I, I really do don't I? She heard Fuku say, in a voice that sounded much giddier than what Kiba was used to. Kiba immediately stopped walking and looked at Toru's door with surprise and confusion. Fuku. What is she doing with Toru? And what's this about looking cute? We always said you were cute. Eri's voice was the next one Kiba heard. Thank you. I think you're cute too. Fuku giggled. Actually giggled. Now Kiba needed to know what was happening. She knocked on the door rather loudly, given her strength, it was nearly impossible for her to knock any other way. What's happening in there? Oh, oh. Lady Kiba. You can, actually, just give us a second please my lady. Toru said. Kiba sighed. Fine. I will wait. But my time is precious so do your best not to waste it. Of course my lady. Taru giggled. Kiba heard some whispers on the other side of the door. She couldn't make anything out, but she was sure they were planning something. After a couple minutes, Toru responded again. Okay, we're ready, come inside. Kiba squinted at the door with suspicion. I wonder what they did in those last two minutes. She opened the door and... A roar! On the other side was Fuku but she looked very different from how she was used to seeing her. There was no hoodie in sight, instead she wore a brown and pastel dress, with a skirt covered in bears and a big bear paw on top. She also had on brown stockings and little bear paw shoes and bear paw gloves. Her hair was also brushed and styled into pigtails held by bear-themed hair clips with a barrier headband on top. Fuku currently had both her pawed hands up, trying to make herself look menacing and it was the single cutest thing Kiba had ever seen. Thud! Al Lady Kiba! Fuku shouted out in horror as Kiba fell back onto the floor, clutching her heart. I'm fine. I think I just saw an image of the afterlife. And it beautiful. Fuku said as she pulled herself up and looked at Fuku. Fuku, what possessed you to wear such adorable attire? You don't like it? Fuku asked, looking discouraged. No. Do not mistake my words. You look so cute I wish to burn your current appearance into my memory. Kiba corrected her. In other words, she thinks you look super cute too Kiba. Taru giggled. Fuku started believing us about her being cute all of a sudden, and now she wants to dress up. Eri said, and now that brought attention to herself, Kiba suddenly got a look at her outfit. She was dressed in a bright ruby red dress with some black accents and some red gemstones along the skirt. She also wore a pair of bright red shoes and a red hat. All of which made her utterly adorable as well. After taking a good long look at the two of them, really drinking in the sight, she turned to Toru. So these two have been here, dressing up in various adorable outfits, and you didn't see it fit to summon me. I'm sorry Lady Kiba, if it helps I did take pictures. Toru said, trying to appease her. I trust those pictures will be sent to me with haste, Kiba said before she turned to see Fuku looking in the mirror again, smiling. Dear sister, as happy as I am at this development, you appear to be in an unusually good mood. I wish to know what caused it. Oh, I, I don't know. Fuku admitted. I just looked in the mirror, and I... I didn't feel like I was myself. I mean I'm still me but I don't feel like me. I normally don't like me but right now I feel, I feel like someone that I do like. Fuku looked into the mirror at her reflection and smiled, touching the mirror. I feel like, I like myself. While Fuku was smiling at herself in a mirror, everyone else gave her a confused look. Not quite understanding what she meant by that, but getting a general impression that it was a good thing. Well, you seem happy so it must be a good thing. Toru surmised. Hey Lady Kiba, can we dress them up in some of your clothes? Please. Normally, Kiba would scold her for suggesting such a thing. However, the thought of putting Fuku in some of her more elegant clothes. I will allow it. Really thank you, sis. Fuku said, giving Kiba a smile, brighter than any she'd given before. 
Thud. Kiba. Kiba closed her eyes, as she lay on the ground. I have lived long enough to witness the radiance of a thousand supernovas. Truly, it was good a life. I can rest in peace. Lady Kiba no. Toru shouted dramatically. However, however before they could continue the bit, they heard the sound of running in the halls outside. Wait a minute, it was just a prank. Shouted a panicked Mina as they heard her running by. We just wanted to improve your relationships. Shiruku shouted in that same panicked state. Come back here, you pink devil. They heard Achiko shout, sounding very, very angry. You a dead woman, Mina. You hear me. Jiro yelled, sounding even angrier. I'm gonna fry you, you little bug. Shouted Ken in his heat blast form. I'm an arachnida. Hot. 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 Shiruku cried. As the sounds moved away from them, as the chase continued further into the house, the girls all looked at each other. Should we be concerned? Eri asked. There was a short pause before Kiba answered. I'm sure father has that under control. Now, to my room. XXXXXXXXXX. Mina and Shiroku stood in Izuku's office, in front of the green at himself, with their heads held low, and their bodies banged up. Mina was covered up in bandages, with bruises all over her face, the swelling very evident. Shiruku was also covered in bandages, with burns covering her body. And Izuku was looking over them with a deadpan expression. expression. So, I'm not surprised, I'm just slightly disappointed. We were only trying to help out, and have some fun. Shiruku pouted. I'm sure you were. Trying to pair me and Achiko, Jiro, and Kaminari. Trying to get Ken to admit that he appreciates his sister. Getting Fuku to finally love herself. At face value, these all sound like great things. Izuku sighed. However, once you actually think about them, you start to see why am I said they were so dangerous. What if, while under the influence of the candy, Jiro did something she wouldn't normally, and then heavily regretted it? Love is not an easy thing to handle emotion. And it can cause people to do stupid things. And even if anyone got together under the influence of the candies, would they stay together after the effects wore off? Would it damage their relationship if they tried getting together? Would it damage their relationship if they broke up after the effects wore off? How would one party feel if they knew the reason they got together with someone else is because that person was essentially drugged into, into liking them more? Well, when you put it like that. Mina wilted under Izuka's logic, rubbing her arm sheepishly. Shiruku just looked at the floor. And as for Ken, what if instead of confiding in his sister, he pushed her away even more? Ken has a tendency to react rashly and had things gone in a slightly different relationship, it could have done some damage to his relationship with his sister, which would have seriously hurt him. Izuku continued. And as for Fuku, well, I'll be honest. I've considered using a mice quirk to do something like this with her before. It'd be nice if Fuku could appreciate herself. However, the ultimate issue with that is what happens when the effects wear off. Fuku enjoyed the feeling of loving herself so much, and she was absolutely crushed when I told her the effects weren't permanent. And it was a good thing I did find out, otherwise, she would have had to figure that out the hard way. Can you imagine how distraught she would have been, trying to figure out why she can't view herself in the same positive light anymore? Both Mina and Shiruku winced as they felt the guilt crushing them like a boulder. Fortunately, nothing too terrible happened. Ken's a bit miffed and he's gonna be upset with you too for a while. And Fuku's quite upset. But we can take some positives from this situation. Izuku revealed. Now I know a bit more about how Ken feels, which should offer good insight when I get him into therapy. And now that Fuku knows that she is capable of loving herself, she can work towards doing so without relying on a mice candy. Ultimately speaking, we're very lucky that this panned out in probably the best way it could have. Have. But things could have gotten really bad if just a few things were different. Sorry, daddy. Shiruku apologized. 
I'm really sorry boss. Mina also apologized. Don't apologize to me, apologize to everyone you affected with this stunt, Izuku told them with a sigh. Although to be honest, I must take partial responsibility. I knew the dangers of ice candies could cause if used incorrectly, and I didn't explain them to everyone. As such, I'll also take the time to apologize to everyone when I get the chance. Mina wanted to argue. This felt like something that was firmly her fault, but at the same time she wasn't really in a position to talk back, so she held her tongue. All right, you two are dismissed, Izuku told them, sending them away. As Mina and Shiroku left, Izuku sunk back into his chair. I should have figured something like this would happen. Well, at least I can use this as an example when I'm explaining why not to use Amai's candies so freely. Well, back to work. And with that over, Izuku opened a file on his desk that he had been looking at. The file was for a young man. A therapist to be exact. He was a rising star in the mental health community, with his strange, yet effective quirk which he would use to help out his patients. It was far from conventional, and there was a warning that he couldn't work with anyone with suicidal thoughts or feelings, which made Izuku a bit hesitant. Still, he was quite curious, as apparently, he was able to help people with serious mental issues and roadblocks, overcome them in an astonishingly short amount of time. And from what he read it was just a darn interesting quirk. One he'd love to see in action. Which was why he would be undergoing a session with the man before he sent any of the children. Just to make sure this was actually safe. Renikara, Izuku said the man's name out loud as he read over the information. Hopefully, you'll be able to help us out. We desperately need it. That will be it for this part. I hope everyone enjoyed if you did please leave a like and comment if you want part 18. If you want to hear more from me subscribe I hope to see you all in the next one.